Thank you, Alex. So this has been a great conference. I feel like, uh, for me at least, there's been a lot that I've been sitting there being like, yeah, yeah, this is good, this is good. Um, the downside of that is I feel like a lot of the stuff I was going to say has already been said much more eloquently by <laughs> other people this morning and yesterday. Um, so I'll, I'll try and shift my focus a little to some stuff that might be new, but uh, I guess let me just plus one a lot of the great talks uh, from Santiago this morning and, and Trolley yesterday and the utility API. Uh, I mean, a lot of those beats I think you're going to see in this, in this uh, discussion as well. Uh, so my name's Gord. I'm a, a researcher slash software developer at, uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, where I work a lot on uh, grid modeling and building grid tools and uh, grid modeling tools and getting them to talk to each other. And I'll kind of talk through a bit what those complexities look like and uh, uh, what some of those, those tools look like uh, here. Uh, but I'll say I'm also wearing a second hat, and that's uh, as uh, the co-lead of one of the pillars of the Global Power System Transformation Consortium um, that NREL is pretty actively involved in. Um, so GPST is, uh, as the name suggests, a consortium of um, primarily power system operators and research institutions um, from around the world uh, working on addressing the remaining technical challenges to how we can actually plan and operate uh, power systems with very high levels of renewable integration, specifically um, focused on inverter-based resources, which are kind of a paradigm shift from how we've traditionally run power systems in the past. Um, so we've got representation from all over the world. Uh, our six founding system operators are really focused, uh, are, are kind of ahead of the curve as far as needing to integrate a large share of renewables. So here in the US, we have ERCOT and the California ISO. Um, and then in Europe, we've got AirGrid in Ireland and um, EnergyNet in Denmark, as well as National Grid ESO in the UK uh, and uh, AMO in Australia. Um, but we also work with uh, a wide variety of system operators all over the country and basically every continent, or yeah, all over the world and basically every continent um, uh, that are d at different stages of, of their decarbonization journeys. Um, as well as yeah, re research institutes like like Enri and EPREL and and EPRI and NREL and VTT uh, in Finland, uh, Fraunhofer in Germany. Uh, we're organized into kind of five pillars uh, as far as the actual work that we do. Um, so pillar one is all about looking forward and identifying what uh, what research questions haven't we solved yet that we're going to need to solve to get to these really high levels of renewables that we want to integrate in our power systems. Um, so articulating that research agenda and then uh, kind of laying out the pathway to solve those questions with our research partners, uh, including NREL. Uh, pillar two is all about system operator technical assistance. Uh, so this is, rather than saying this is where we are today and this is the cutting edge and where do we need to go next, getting the rest of the world caught up to that cutting edge and state of the art and making sure we, we all aren't reinventing wheels and solving challenges that someone else has already figured out how to solve who's maybe further along that decarbonization journey. Um, so through this, we work with, uh, with power system operators uh, yeah, all over the world, India, South Africa, Vietnam, Pakistan, just to name a couple examples. Um, pillar three is all about workforce development. So this is saying there's a skill set gap in the power industry. There's skills that we need to get to where we want to go collectively. Uh, that we don't have today. So how do we change how we're training the next generation of power systems engineers and other folks coming out of universities to get them the skills they need to, um, to be able to help solve these problems that, that we know we need to, to fix and solve in order to get to where we want to be. Um, pillar four is all about standards. Uh, so grid codes, those types of things, trying to align them, make them uh, easier to adopt and to conform to so that hardware vendors can, can be good uh, citizens of the grid and everyone can, uh, can get along and, and ensure we have uh, reliable systems that aren't uh, really uh, kind of hard and burdensome to arrive at. And then pillar five, which is the one I'm most involved in and, and the one that's most relevant to our discussion today, is on open data and tools. Um, so saying, what are the, the problems we need to solve? What are the tools we need to develop in order to solve those to get to where we're trying to 
to be in operating these high renewable power systems? And how do we make sure that these tools are available uh, and widely accessible to all, all kinds of system operators so that this, the, this doesn't become an impediment to being able to actually integrate the levels of renewables that we need? And that can span both planning timescales, which is primarily the focus of what I'm going to talk about today, but also operational timescales. We have some really interesting work going on in our Control Room of the Future Implementation Council that's looking at the future of control room architectures and, and modular um, components and, and open standards. Um, so things like the trolley presentation yesterday were very interesting for me uh, to, to hear about that as well. So that's a little bit about GPST um, and kind of what we're trying to do. Um, to shift gears a bit and talk a bit about power systems and why pl planning a power system for these high renewable futures is a lot more complicated than it used to be. What we see, uh, what we've seen historically has been we get a lot of really vital critical grid services for free from uh, traditional synchronized rotating masses that uh, are kind of the, the primary constituent of traditional generating plants, right? Coal plants, gas plants, hydro, nuclear. And when we move to an inverter-based future with lots of wind and solar and, and battery storage on the system, the actual electrical engineering requirements of that system aren't necessarily met automatically by those types of devices. So we need to be much more proactive in ensuring that the systems that we're designing actually meet those technical requirements. And this requires moving across all these different time scales of, of uh, modeling and simulation to understand how these factors interact at, at different levels. So whereas traditionally one would think about um, like generation planning as kind of its own thing and off in the corner and, and you know the generation planners didn't necessarily have to talk that often to transmission planners for example. Uh, these days these, these questions be, are becoming a lot more um, complex and sophisticated and, and require much more uh, sophisticated analytical pipelines to be able to answer uh, the questions that we need to answer to design uh, a reliable future grid that that does what we want it to do. Uh, and, and this spans all these different timescales. And it, it would be great if we could just say, okay, well, now we need to basically put all this into one box, one model. We can just push the button and get an answer. But these, these different... Um, these different simulation processes and, and modeling tools all are built on different types of mathematical foundations. So uh, down at the like millisecond to second simulation level, you've got your stability analysis, which might, might be RM, RMS or EMT simulations, and those are all predicated on solving systems of differential equations. And you move out to uh, steady state power flow, right? And that's nonlinear uh, algebraic equations. And then you're getting out to resource adequacy and capacity expansion modeling, unit commitment economic dispatch. These are linear, mixed integer, linear programming problems. Um, and so there's no like Uber model that you can just kind of put all this in and and, and get the answer you need. You kind of implicitly have this federation of different tools that all have different kind of perspectives on the grid and what they can capture and what they can't capture. And we need them to get them to talk to each other. Uh, and that is something that uh, is becoming increasingly important because of all these shifts in, in how we need to plan the system, but is also really a big challenge, as you can probably imagine, um, from both a software perspective and a kind of human uh, change management perspective and, and getting all these different diverse teams to, to talk to each other as well. Um, so I am not here today to uh, tell you we've solved this and explain how we solved it. Hopefully maybe you know in a couple of years when we meet again, uh, we, I can give that presentation. Um, but more to outline uh, where some of those challenges come from and uh, what's been done in the past to try to address those and, and how we're hoping to maybe contribute to that. Um, so I guess the first thing I'll say is, is these, these multi-model workflows are not hypothetical, like, oh, we're going to need them in 10 years, something like that. These are already things that are happening today. And uh, just to take you know, a smaller slice of that bigger kind of cascade that I showed before, here's one example um, from Madeline McPherson's group at the University of Victoria in Canada, where they're, doing, they're looking at transmission expansion planning um, uh, uh, using a suite of different models. So they have a capacity expansion model. Maybe can I, uh, can you see that mouse? Yeah. Or I can go, yeah. So they have a, a capacity expansion model, for example, which is open source, which is great. Uh, and then they, they, they take in input assumptions about 
future system conditions, what things are going to cost, what you know weather conditions are going to be in different places, and how that has implications on both supply in terms of wind and solar generation, but also demand uh, in terms of temperatures and, and impacts on load. Uh, they run that through their capacity expansion model. They get out some future system portfolio, which then they want to test in a production cost model, uh, which they have an open source production cost model or a resource adequacy model. Um, and they actually use NREL's resource adequacy model uh, for that. And then, uh, so right off the bat, you've got these three different tools. They all need to talk to each other. And these data flows aren't even one way, right? So the reason you're testing uh, your unit commitment and economic dispatch in a production cost model, for example, is because you can't fit all that detail into the capacity expansion model. So you need to kind of take your best guess at enforcing some useful constraints in the capacity expansion step, but then you're really checking your work with your probabilistic resource adequacy tool or your deterministic dispatch tool. And if you find problems, then you need to feed that information back into the capacity expansion model and adaptively add more constraints or tweak your, your assumptions or your uh, conditions that you're uh, requesting of the system design. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of very common pattern that, that you'll see in, in lots of different examples of you have this capacity expansion step and then you're going downstream to various tools below that. But all upstream, there are also lots of considerations to take into account. So for example, uh, this is uh, kind of an analogous uh, workflow from the Puerto Rico 100 study that DOE funded and NREL was uh, heavily involved in. Uh, so this was looking at uh, how do we uh, transition Puerto Rico to a resilient 100% uh, renewable power system as part of the rebuilding efforts there. Um, so that obviously centered around a capacity expansion model similar to the, the approach before, and then it actually had exactly like this, uh, downstream production cost and resource adequacy modeling, but it also had a lot of upstream modeling. So things like, I know this text is pretty small, um, but things like um, distributed technology adoption. What are people doing behind the meter and how do we incorporate that into our planning processes? Uh, what, what are load projections gonna look like? What are weather uh, conditions gonna be? So all of these different kind of disparate data sets, different modeling paradigms uh, come, need to come together and that data needs to be integrated and go into the capacity expansion model and then go out to these other downstream models as well in a coherent fashion. One of our biggest um, kind of examples of this type of workflow at NREL was the Los Angeles 100% Renewable Energy Study. Um, and again, you can kind of see this core of your capacity expansion model in the middle, doing the portfolio selection, and then going downstream to a resource adequacy model and a production cost model. Um, but there was also much more complicated than that, right? So we have those upstream models again, looking at um, uh, building turnover rates and uh, distributed technology adoption, but also um, look getting into power flow and dynamics, which requires not just information about the actual uh, system portfolios that are coming out of the capacity expansion model, but also um, set point, generator set points, you know, what is online, when, how much is it generating at from your production cost modeling, for example. Um, and what was really cool about LA100 is we didn't just stop at uh, the kind of electrical engineering analysis, but it also went much further and looked at um, equity and social justice impacts, environmental analysis, air quality, uh, jobs, all these types of things. And these obviously require lots of other tools that don't traditionally talk to your you know, hardcore electrical engineering softwares, uh, which required a lot more uh, additional uh, movement of data between these different pieces. Um, and I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll say this was a, a big kind of data engineering effort to do and, and we frankly did a really bad job of it. Like it was extremely manual to move these data sets between these different tools and you would uh, have to redo a run and then you know there'd be all this kind of extra work required to make sure everyone was using the updated data and, and lots of you know manually annotating notes and tracking and, and things like that. Um, and that's inspired a lot of a lot of subsequent work to try and automate and streamline those processes because these types of analyses are something that um, we see not just NREL but industry more broadly needing to do um, in much uh, much more frequently, much more commonly as we move um, to these systems that you know are going to work very differently from the way they work today. Uh, and then finally, one more recent example is um, the National Transmission Planning Study uh, that NREL, oops, that NREL was uh, involved in with the Department of Energy. Um, and this was you know, following a very similar infrastructure to 
you know, all these other types of, of, of studies that I mentioned before, but at a, at a totally different scale, right? Rather than looking at the island of Puerto Rico or the city of Los Angeles, we're looking at the entire continental US and trying to understand you know, very long, very kind of wide scale, long-term uh, transmission extension strategies um, that, that can help us meet, meet the, the policy targets that, that are driving um, these changes. So uh, that, this would all be fine if these types of studies kind of happen in a vacuum. You know, if Enron was the only person, the only institution in the world doing these types of things, having our kind of ad hoc processes point to point between our, our specific tools, you know, might not be the end of the world. But even within these four studies, so one of which is, is, is not an NREL study, the other three are, and these are just ones that I kind of had at my fingertips and, and pulled up to put in this deck, but not uh, necessarily um, unique, you know, there's lots of other people in lots of other places doing things that look just like this as well. Uh, even within these studies, I mean, we've got four different capacity expansion models being used in each, three different production cost models. By kind of coincidence, kind of not, they all use the same resource adequacy tool. That's probably selection bias just because I've developed that tool, so I know about studies that are using it. Um, but y there's lots of, of this kind of mixing and matching that we want to end up doing. Um, so this kind of linear approach to like having one stack, one data pipeline where you have your capacity expansion model and you have your production cost model and you have in, um, upstream input data and you have downstream results visualization, just to take like one sliver of those spaghetti diagrams that were on the previous slide. This doesn't really start working once you have a bunch of other tools that you might want to use interchangeably for these different processes based on the specific needs of your analysis um, all running in parallel. So there's lots of situations. I think probably the, the most obvious one is input data sets, right? So someone's already gone out and curated a nice data set about the United States power system and the potential cost implications of um, like the IRA, right? And the, 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 the um, incentives associated with that. So if I'm, you know, green capacity expansion modeler here, I really don't want to have to re reinvent that reel, right? And recreate re, uh, that data set that someone else for their blue study has already uh, done a great job of curating. You know, I'd love to just be able to take that and look at that and be able to easily load that into my model. Uh, similarly, maybe I'm a production cost modeler and I want to study the operational impacts of some scenario that's been generated by a capacity expansion model um, by, you know, some other organization or, you know, maybe I, I want to grab that and, and study some implications of that that, you know, weren't one of the small number of things that ended up included in the report that the person who, who ran that study uh, ended up looking at. Um, but, you know, these types of crossings across these different sort of silos, even if all of the individual tools within these pipelines are open source and theoretically, you know, something that we can build on and, 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 and use and, and, uh, and collaborate on, really end up uh, not being practical just because there's so many barriers in the way of actually getting that data that's in some format with some certain set of assumptions and, and moving it into uh, a different format that would be compatible with the tool that I want to use, um, whether it's for just visualizing the end results and I'm not actually doing any analysis on that or you know I have some particular uh, uh, assumption that I need to study in more detail and you know have developed my own kind of one-off piece that you know um, works or replaces a part of this pipeline, but I really don't need to reinvent the whole wheel and I don't want to rebuild these kind of one-to-one -one, uh, kind of point-to-point -point, um, connections that uh, was talked about in the, in the trolley presentation yesterday as well. And so with this sort of point-to-point -point architecture, we have this multiplicative problem, right? Where if you have three capacity expansion models and three production models and you just kind of write a translator for one tool to from one input to one output, you end up with, with nine different potential translators that you could need to write. And you, even though you, in theory, have this like set of open source tools, it's really not an open ecosystem where you can actually kind of use them in a modular fashion um, and, and interchange uh, data between them um, and, and actually use them in the, in the way that, that is the point of, or one of the points of open source software, which is not having to reinvent all these wheels and uh, being able to leverage the work that others have done and then putting your own unique kind of value add on top of that. Um, so uh, GPST maintains uh, this open tools portal where we uh, kind of catalog uh, different open source um, power system grid modeling tools. 
uh, in different categories. So just as sort of a quick example, and, and this is all crowdsourced as well. So if, if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, my, my model isn't on there, sorry, no, no uh, intention to offend. Please go on there and, and help us make it better by, uh, by adding your tool there too. Um, but, but just as a quick example, right? So there's seven capacity expansion models, which do the portfolio optimization, and then nine production cost modeling tools, which do the kind of hour to hour unit commitment and economic dispatch um, of, the, of, the, of the grid, for example. And if you actually wanted a, a nice, uh, an easy way to move from any one of these tool, any one of these capacity expansion models into any one of these production cost models, I mean, you're, you're looking at 63 potential implementations of these point to point translators that you'd have to implement in order to actually uh, pull that off. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's crazy. I mean, there's not 63 in, uh, organizations or groups working on, 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 on these models, right? Like uh, you have this, this multiplica multiplicative problem where the more models you have, the more kind of out of hand this gets. Um, so really what we need, and I, I'm, I'm not even preaching to the choir here. I feel like I'm preaching to the, the Pope. I mean, you people are, are better at this than I am. Um, but what we really need are, are standards to kind of like help us move these, these, this data between all of these different parts of these processes uh, in, a, in, a, in a more uniform way so that if I, have an, if I curate an input data set and I design it to the standard, then any capacity expansion model that implements that uh, standard as well gets the ability to import that data for free. And, and same if I uh, have a tool that ingests data in that standardized format, now any tool upstream of that um, can, can work with that. And by doing that, obviously, we eliminate that multiplica multiplicative problem, and, and now we just have this kind of additive number of uh, translators that need to be developed. And the, the kind of um, distribution of, of responsibility is much clearer now, because if I develop a tool, then I probably also develop the importer for that tool and the exporter for that tool. And it's not like I have 10 different importers or exporters that I need to be maintaining or kind of ambiguously like, is that my problem? If you can't import my data into your tool, maybe that's your problem. Maybe that's the user's problem. And you know, neither of us are gonna fix that and some third party's gonna have to address that. And these are uh, very real problems that we experience all the time at NREL working with you know, a wide, variety of different in-house developed software. You know, we don't uh, do a great job of, of doing this and it's something that internally we're trying to work on, um, but we're not the only uh, people trying to solve this problem. Um, so yeah, so in that case you'd end up with, with just 16 implementations rather than 63, which is, is much more manageable. So that's great. Um, it's easier said than done. I, again, probably don't need to uh, convince this audience of that. Um, what does that actually look like in practice? Um, so there are, uh, there are some kind of high-level principles that, that we can think about here, and I won't spend too much time on this because, again, a lot of the folks here are better at this than me. Um, but, but what we typically do when you know, you're an individual modeling team and you've got uh, you know, a particular tool and you want to get your data into some other tool is you, you kind of start at the, the most concrete level. It's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this out to a particular file format and then that's going to serialize all this stuff and then I can store it on disk and email it to my colleague or whatever or upload it to a file share, whatever that looks like. Um, and then they'll write an importer that, that takes that format and, and, and loads it back in. And that's kind of like the most immediate, obvious way to go about that. That, that that's actually solves the problem you have at hand and that, that makes a lot of sense if you're kind of in a vacuum where you just have these two tools to worry about. The problem is that in doing that, you embed all these implicit assumptions that are, are kind of at this more abstract level of, of how the world is organized and what relationships are or aren't possible in it. Um, as well as you know more kind of uh, uh, implementation specific details about you know naming conventions and things like that. Um, so uh, what we traditionally see today, I would say, is within you know individual modeling teams, we have this kind of bottom up approach where we start with these data formats and are implicitly providing a data specification embedded in that, um, and that in and that particular specification implies a particular logical model, model or ontology about how your data actually works together. Um, and that uh, is great until you start needing to interoperate with someone else who didn't design their tool with the exact same set of assumptions you did. So you can start with two individual data sets that uh, 
are probably in different data formats, right? Like I've got a pile of CSVs and you've got a relational database or, or a key value store or whatever that might be. Um, and of course those formats don't adhere to the same specification. You know, if they did, then we could translate between them pretty easily um, in an automated way. You know, everything, all the names would line up and it'd all be kind of easy. Um, and, but, you know, potentially it's not even a naming problem. There may be fundamentally different assumptions about kind of the state of the world and, and how we represent relationships between these, these different pieces of data that, that are fundamentally incompatible. Um, so uh, one example of this would be whether or not you uh, think that circuit breakers are an, are an important part of your network topology or not, right? So for a lot of power flow studies and dynamic studies and things, um, a bus branch model where you just basically treat your entire power system as, as fused together, you know, one static piece of metal is, is perfectly valid. Um, but as soon as you start getting into like topology optimization or understanding protection schemes or things like that, you really kind of need to know where those circuit breakers are. And if your data model doesn't have a fundamental understanding of that, then it's, it's of no use to someone who wants to use it for those types of applications. But then of course there's trade-offs because getting down to that kind of node breaker representation involves a lot of extra complexity as well in, in representing the data and creates burden for people who don't need that. Uh, so kind of navigating those, those kinds of trade-offs um, can be a difficult uh, design challenge. Um, you may have two data sets that actually adhere to the same underlying data format, right? Like they're both a bunch of JSON files. That obviously doesn't help necessarily. Okay, great. Now maybe you don't you don't have to import two parser libraries, but the the that JSON data could be encoded in totally different and incompatible ways. Uh, what you really ideally would be doing is be starting from some kind of shared understanding of uh, how the world works, what the relations between those are, some kind of um, common model for for an, an ontology of of how you want to represent things. And then you may or may not be able to um, align in terms of naming conventions or the format that things are in, but at the very least, you have an ability to convert between these data formats um, uh, without having to make assumptions or, or lose information along the way. And of course, the kind of the further down this stack you can push uh, your alignment between different projects, then the easier things get. And at the, if, if you can eventually get to the point where you have a single data format that everyone's just using um, that encodes the same assumptions about specifying the, the data and its relationships between each other, then that's, you know, that's beautiful. Then you can all just, just use that. And that's what, what a lot of projects here are, are trying to work towards. I would say though that there, like, there are valid technical reasons that you may not want to be using the exact same data representation. Like in some cases, a relational database makes sense, but if your whole point is to pass messages over a network, then you, know, you probably don't want to be sending the, the, the literal on-disk representation of that relation database over the network, right? So there's, there's, there's different uh, applications that, that are a, a valid fit. But as long as you have some higher level, level of alignment, then you can always reconcile those different representation formats later. Um, so like I said, NREL is obviously not the first person to rec or the first organization to recognize this problem. Um, there's things like the common information model, which are designed to address this exact problem. Um, SIM is, uh, I'd say, focused on a, solving a, a related but different problem to the kind of planning problems I've talked about here. Uh, it's, uh, it's got great kind of theoretical groundings in, in developing an abstract ontology, um, but is really focused on very granular, highly resolved infrastructure asset management um, and, and really focused on kind of real-time message passing as opposed to the kind of um, batch time series data representations that we most often need when we're talking about doing a long-term planning study and we want to store, you know, 40 years of historical weather data or things like that. Sims really kind of about passing around information in the moment. Um, there's, uh, and yeah, so it, but it, it kind of has this uh, nice abstract ontology that you can then implement in different ways. Although in practice, there are also serialization standards that are defined by the IEC. And in practice, those are the standards that a lot of people actually end up um, implementing uh, in, their, in their specific software tools. So it's kind of a little bit of both as far as whether it's you know, really abstract or, or really concrete. Another example that's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from SIM when it comes to um, 
the granularity of representation is the open energy ontology, which is really not a data um, ontology so much as a metadata ontology, I would say. It's really about annotating data sets with descriptors or tags about what this data set is about. So it defines this hierarchy of vocabularies about increasingly kind of detailed aspects of, of basically nouns in your, in your uh, relational schema. Um, but isn't, not so, isn't so much focused on how you represent relationships between those nouns. There, are, there, are, there is a bit of that, but for example, you can't, um, there, I, to my, as far as I know, there's no way in OEO to actually say this bus is connected to this transmission line. It just basically gives you thing, standardized things to describe what a transmission line is or what an electrical bus is. Um, but again, this is kind of at that more abstract level, and then you, you would be able to um, define your own implementations and serializations of that based on your particular needs. Uh, two examples of, of attempts to kind of bridge this gap at a more concrete level. Um, one uh, comes out of the national labs uh, as part of the North American Energy Resilience Modeling uh, uh, work uh, called the Common Transmission Model. And this is something that we're using internally to pass um, different power flow and unit commitment and economic dispatch problems between uh, different um, national labs that are, need to collaborate and use different tools. And so we're, we're sending these different data sets you know, between all these different places, you know, from Los Alamos to Lawrence Livermore to NREL to PNNL. Um, and in doing that, uh, obviously, we need, we need these data sets to be able to talk to each other. Um, so this is, is one example of a, a, a more concrete specification of, of what that actually looks like. So um, the, there is no like formal ontology or like RDF representation of these relationships. It, like, it literally is a PDF with, with tables and like call this variable this thing and, and this name and, and those types of things. So uh, I do, and, and it's really focused on, on specifically operational problems. So I, I don't suggest that this is a, uh, a, a, a panacea or you know the solution, but it's 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 w our one of our first attempts to kind of move in this direction of having a standardized way of of moving this kind of information between our different models. Um, and then another example uh, coming from our collaborators at VTT in Finland and Europe is the ENAS data specification, um, which is part of the EU funded MOFO project, um, which tries to uh, take a more general approach to. Uh, in, encoding some of the same type of information, not sp not as specifically from a power systems perspective, uh, like the CTM does or SIM, um, but from a broader energy systems perspective. So not just dealing with power networks, but also thinking about heat networks, um, fuel networks, uh, water, things like that, and how you could fit all of that into a kind of more general framework for representing energy infrastructure networks. Uh, as well, and right now it's actually more focused on the planning kind of long-term time scales rather than the, the shorter-term operations. So we, we are um, talking with BTT a little bit about how maybe we could, we could combine this with the CTM and sort of get the best of both worlds that's more tailored towards the sort of planning time scale problems as opposed to, you know, get the really granular type of uh, data that, that's a, a bit more cumbersome and involved to, to implement fully that you would get out of something like the SIM, for example. Um, and in a lot of cases, you don't have um, all the details and information you would need to populate uh, a, a SIM representation of a transmission network anyways, because we're talking about something that isn't going to exist for another 30 years. Uh, and so, yeah, so that also is a... Um, kind of a, a data specification with naming conventions and things like that. Uh, the sort of flagship implementation of that tool is, um, or that, that specification is in the Spine Toolbox, which is an open source uh, toolbox for um, loading data in and then sending it off to, to different models. Uh, sort of uh, one uh, attempt at, at how we solve this problem that I described at the beginning of, of having this common data set that we can move around and, and use in different types of analysis. Uh, so, you know, I just gave four different examples of things that are solving this problem. On one hand, that's good. We have multiple solutions. On the other hand, that's bad because really it's a sign that uh, of uh, a broader tendency that, you know, we have this problem. Let's go invent our own solution to it because, you know, maybe we do a cursory scan of what's already out there and don't see anything that uh, aligns specifically with our needs. Or maybe uh, we don't even do that and just, you know, dive right into, oh, I have this problem. I need to solve it right now. I'm going to go solve that. And, you know, it'd be more work to try and figure out something that maybe already exists that I can reuse to do this. 
uh, which, which certainly leads to challenges. I mean, to go back to the, the parallel data pipelines from the beginning, right? If, if everyone has their open source tools, but they don't talk to each other, you kind of just have these glass silos. Uh, and, and those tools really don't meet the, um, the, the potential value that, that they could by you know, existing in this open source ecosystem. Um, there are, I think, legitimate challenges and reasons why one might look at a particular solution to this problem and say that's not quite the right fit for me. Um, you obviously, you need to balance between something that's very concrete that is kind of straightforward to implement and says, okay, this is what I need to do. This is how I represent the things that I have that I need to represent, but also can be abstract enough to cover use cases that maybe weren't explicitly thought of when developing the format. Um, and, and with that obviously comes trade-offs that are kind of correlated around how easy is this to implement versus uh, is it sophisticated enough to capture all the nuances of the, the system that I'm trying to represent. Um, and I would suggest that if we keep trying to solve this problem in isolation in you know, our individual silos, uh, we're gonna keep coming up with solutions that fit our specific use case, but maybe don't consider adjacent use cases that with a bit of minimal effort could be uh, expanded or adapted in such a way that we could solve the problems of others as well. Um, so my sort of call to action here would be um, that as uh, tool developers, we stop trying to reinvent wheels that others have developed and instead say, if I have uh, a, a legitimate technical grievance with the way something's been implemented, is there a way that I can either um, adapt that and contribute back to improve on that? Um, or maybe we, it's just a matter of getting all these folks in the same room um, and we can come up with uh, standard number 15 that actually does solve everyone's problems. I don't know, maybe I'm just being optimistic, but uh, that's, that's sort of why we're all here, right? Um, so with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, yeah, I guess this, I'll, just to go back to the, the starting point, we have this these great ecosystem right now, or, or this great diversity of tools that are open source, you know, across lots of different planning timescales, planning operations, dynamics, power flow, many of which are under LF Energy's umbrella um, or other, other places. But if we can't get them all to talk to each other, I think we're, we're missing out on a lot of the value that could be there um, if we had a better interoperability story as an industry. Um, so uh, with that, I will actually uh, sign off and uh, thank you for your attention. If any of this is interesting, please do reach out to me. We'd love to chat more. Um, we are actively uh, trying right now to get uh, some of these folks in the same room and uh, would love to involve you in that conversation uh, around how we, how we come up with a more uh, sustainable solution to this challenge uh, for the long term that, uh, that we can all coalesce around, or at least more of us can, even if maybe it's not the silver bullet for everyone. So with that, thank you, and uh, we can use any time left for uh, questions and discussion. Thank you for your talk. Uh, well, I'm one of uh, developers of capacity expansion type of models, which is not on the list yet. So, but uh, what I what I want to share is um, so we we uh, I mean uh, there are four models and uh, capacity expansion right now being compared, and uh, s uh, data is fitted by uh, something like what you envision here, like uh, uh, one software, one piece of software which which provides data to all models. And uh, so in our project, which is funded by Sloan, it's multi-model, uh, model inter, inter comparison project with Timo, uh, GenX, Switch, and Eosensis. So basically, uh, Power Genome is actually doing something like what, what you're proposing here, like this blue blue dot uh, to provide the data with the same protocol and model developers are, are writing their own like pieces to connect to the power genome so this is what we have been doing and um, yeah but i agree so it's very important to have this uh, like 
to, to be able to compare the models and uh, uh, connect with the data. And also another important part here, so diversity of the models is also very important. It's not, I mean, if it, even, if, even if you have a lot of uh, capacity expansions, when we compare one to each other, so we find, find out that uh, basically uh, there are so, different, so many different ways to solve the same problem. So one model assumes like uh, a perfect foresight and, do, and does like intertemporal optimization, another one just step by step, and so many more like pathways to, I mean, to have a different results on the same data set. Okay, thanks. Agreed, yeah. Hi, thank you, and definitely I'll come back to you uh, to invite you at RT to have the speech uh, online, maybe, uh, because we are very interesting by what you've demonstrated here. It's not a uh, sufficient condition to have open source. It's necessary to interoperate, uh, thanks to, of course, data, but uh, also uh, humans speaking together mm -hmm. about all this uh, ecosystem we have. So thank you so much for, for, for this, and I hope you will accept this invitation. Yeah, gladly. So um, uh, coming from the operations space, it was interesting to see, you know, you looking at SIM is unusable because I, I, I thought there must be something other than operations where SIM is usable, right? <laughs> I can't imagine, uh, yeah. Um, I, I think that 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 your 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 call is the right one, and I'm curious. Uh, you know, there's probably a lot of lessons we can learn from Sim, and you know, and maybe this is a conversation to have with the IEC working groups too. But I feel like there's room for you know, as an industry, we're outgrowing Sim, and should we be looking at some way of building ontologies? You know, learning from another industry and building you know, a, a new approach to building ontologies that are actually gonna scale to what we need. Because um, I think, yeah, even in the operation space, like it looks like it's usable. I, I can tell you no EMS engineer likes to work with a SIM data set. So I, I guess my question then is, um, that's a hard one, you might not have a good answer, but like, so, so what, what's next? How, how can we be any smarter, you know, people who worked on SIM are pretty smart, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and how do we not just repeat that problem, but for a different class of problems, yeah. I don't have that answer, but <laughs> agree it's important to try and figure it out. Not to further put you on the spot, but sort of along in line with that question, um, do you perceive, you know, maybe like personally, right, like not on behalf of uh, like whatever research is, you know, being funded, um, do you perceive a need to sort of wipe the slate clean um, and start over? Like, personally, how do you think about a viable path forward where you have all these models and, like, you you know, you reduce the complexity down from 63 to 16 to 9, you know, maybe. But that's still prohibitive in a lot of cases, right? Do you uh, currently see a future where it is possible to reduce the complexity enough with the, you know, existing interoperability to make it work? Or... Do you think it's maybe more likely that something new, and obviously getting into the issue of now you have 15 standards, uh, is the better solution? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think the current approach is scalable. Um, even with within NREL, we have three capacity expansion models, two production cost models, one resource adequacy model, stuff upstream and downstream of that. And I mean, I can tell you, you know, with people who are, that's literally their job to connect those dots, it, it doesn't work well. And, and part of that is, is not just the quantity of those point-to-point -point connections, but the, the nature of them, such that there's this kind of diffuse responsibility around whose fault is it when someone breaks compatibility? And I mean, you'd think it'd be easy, well, just don't break compatibility, but that actually, from like a, 
a, a, a human management perspective is actually quite challenging because everyone's like, well, now you're slowing, you're making it harder for me to do my job, which isn't necessarily interoperability. It's, you know, answering questions with my tool. And uh, that gets very complicated. So I don't think the status quo works because I think the, the alternative is we agree on that standard and everyone plays by those rules. And I think that solves a lot of those problems. Um, but I mean, to the question earlier, like it's not, it's not a matter of just like, oh, we just do, like if it was easy, we would have done it already, right? Right, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I think we need to do it, but uh, that's not to say that e even though it's maybe the better solution, it's not necessarily gonna be like an easy, like, oh, we just switch and, and then it's fine. Thanks for a really good talk. Um, a lot of what you said resonates to spend a lot of my life like making gluing stuff together. So, yeah. um, and that that framing of the ecosystem, I think we, uh, he really called that out. That you know people are trying to get a job done, answer a question, and they come to an, an ecosystem and they just it's like I can I can just roll my own, <laughs> yeah, as it were, and you know get my answer and move on and maybe put it out there in case someone else picks it up, but then it's just this kind of moribund effort. And um, I, 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 if you'll permit the, you know, a little bit of just chatting, like, I think like language, it's it's similar to like, we're, we've recently uh, operationalized language, right, with these AIs, um, large language models. And I, I wonder like if there isn't something that we can learn from the anthropology and, and linguistics to about like things need to be in discourse for them to keep speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. um, and that discourse in our space is continuous integration. So is there, you know, in your mind, is there, in, in your work in NREL, are there, you know, if, if the bar for releasing a tool of the public was, you have to sh demonstrate that you can hand off to this other tool or this class of tools before you're allowed to publish it as a work product that's done, mm -hmm. is that something that you guys could could tolerate and and maybe even you know lead in? Short answer is no, but <laughs> <laughs> let me let me elaborate. Um, the challenge is incentive misalignment. I think like very very few of our tools are actually funded as tools. They're to to Santiago's point earlier, like it's project based. So it's, t t and to your point, you know, it's I need to answer this question. I'm gonna build this tool that lets me do that or use this existing tool that lets me do that. There is very little in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, we're reporting on publications and on, you know, things like that, industry engagement that, you know, DOE is not looking at, at what we do for them and, and saying, you know, were they using CI or, you know, what was the software quality of, of this or that, or, you know, how use, how easy is it gonna be to take this to, even if it's in their interest, cause the next uh, analysis project they give us will be easier and cheaper with better software practices. Um, it's, there's been a lot of discussions about that. Like, I think we're, we're trying to fix that, but there is a big incentive compatibility problem, I think there that, that is at the root of a lot of that in terms of like what our, at least for us, what our funding model is relative to where we wanna be um, in terms of building products rather than analysis. And I'm, I'm definitely more on the like product side of, of that spectrum, but there are lots of people who do amazing work at NREL who are, you know, they're analysts and they don't wanna be software engineers building CI pipelines and things like that. Um, so that's a challenge that, that we're trying to navigate. And I think is probably, in. Uh, generalizes to the industry more broadly because I mean so many people building these tools are you know grad students and people who you know want to answer a policy question and not necessarily um, there to learn git and 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 do unit tests and all these things that that ideally everyone would be doing but but I think just based on kind of the demographics of who's doing the development doesn't happen thank you I think I'm out of time so with that, thank you.